ready for takeoff. All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, people might trickle in. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me for this talk today. My name is Stacy, and I'm a full stack developer and the US product team lead at workforce.com. So it's kind of in the name, uh, but we build workforce management software uh, focusing on shift-based workplaces, and we do that primarily using Ruby on Rails as our framework. So I work out of our Chicago office, um, and I'm really excited to be here in the warm weather of Houston this week, um, just getting the chance to meet other people in the Ruby community. Uh, so this is Chicago. Um, and I want to get started today with uh, two premises that I think we are going to share in common. One is that we all want to ship products and features efficiently that are going to de deliver value to our users. And then two, um, we would love to do that while also providing a great working experience both for ourselves and the teams that we're a part of. So these are pretty simple, like straightforward goals, but they can be hard to achieve. There are a lot of external factors that are working against us, um, but we can also end up working against ourselves. In particular, the processes that we're using to manage our workflows, um, if left unexamined, can actually slow us down and um, prevent us from delivering as much value as we could. So the question then is how can we design our processes to both improve customer outcomes and make for a better day-to-day -day work experience? So I'm of the opinion that good processes are like good design when you have really good processes in place, you don't really notice them because they are meeting your needs so well. Um, and the processes at that point are not the focus, they are the background structure that helps your team achieve its potential. So just for today though, we are gonna bring the processes to the forefront and I'm gonna share what's worked well for the team that I'm a part of um, and highlight specific aspects of our workflow that help us deliver value and make for a happier working environment. So across the company, we use a project management process called ShapeUp for our feature work. So ShapeUp works really well for our team, um, but another framework or methodology might be better for the way that your team operates. So um, instead of pitching an entire overhaul of your current way of working today, uh, we're gonna explore three common challenges that dev teams face and the um, types of processes that have helped us solve them. So as I share about the solutions that have worked well for us at workforce.com, I invite you to think about your own team processes and consider how they either support or detract from the goals that we're talking about. So specifically, we are gonna be talking about these three challenges. So one, how can we move quickly as a team, whether we're a smaller team or a larger distributed team? Two, how can we make um, work more engaging and provide growth opportunities? And then three, how can we deliver the most value and know that our work is having an impact? So um, as I mentioned, our team uses the ShapeUp methodology for project management. ShapeUp was developed by the team at a company called Basecamp, um, and it was built to help their remote team continue moving quickly as it quadrupled in size. So if you're really interested in um, what you hear today, I would recommend you check out the free Shape Up guide that was written by Ryan Singer. It's available at that URL on Basecamp's website. Um, but for now, we're just gonna focus on the core aspects that, of the framework that we use at workforce.com, and I'm gonna share some additional processes that we've um, implemented that are gonna be unique to our context. So um, that context is we have three offices spread across three continents. Uh, we work in six week cycles followed by a two week cool down period. And each, each six week cycle is set aside for something called shaped work. So shaped work starts as a document called a pitch. 
So a pitch includes several key sections. Uh, a pitch always starts with a problem. Having a really clearly defined problem is gonna make it easier to evaluate the likely effectiveness of different solutions. Um, we, at this point, typically define who we are solving the problem for in terms of users because that makes it easier to compare the impact that addressing different problems is gonna have. Um, from here, it's really tempting to jump straight into a solution, um, but we instead uh, next define something called an appetite. So the appetite essentially replaces a time estimate for the problem. Instead of coming up with a solution and then trying to figure out how long it'll take us to build that solution, we determine how long we are willing to dedicate to solving a particular problem. Um, the really great thing about an appetite is that it provides some boundaries for you as you think about solutions. Um, because if you're only willing to dedicate like two weeks to solving a particular problem, your solution is gonna look a lot different than if you're willing to dedicate a full six week cycle. So then comes the solution. The main details of the solution are um, considered and outlined in the pitch, um, but there is still room for the designers and developers actually building it to apply their own expertise. So the two elements of the shape up process that help you come up with a viable but not too like concrete solution are fat marker sketches and text scoping. So in a pitch, instead of including a high fidelity mockup of what we wanna build, uh, we will include a sketch of the UI drawn with a marker. If you ever drawn with a marker, you know there's only so much detail that you can get in there. Um, and that is what's gonna allow that flexibility for your designers and your developers to figure out what this solution could look like once they get into the code. Um, and then with fat marker sketches, you also avoid the situation in which you might have a really beautiful high fidelity mockup, but it's not achievable in the time frame that you're working with. So once a solution has been outlined, um, we have a member of the dev team tech scope it. And that means they're gonna take some time to consider the feasibility of the solution from a coding perspective. Um, they're gonna address questions like, is this achievable within the given time frame? Um, are there a lot of unknowns that we have or is it pretty clear cut? So once the pitches are created, they move into something called the betting table. So the betting table is made up of the team leads from all of our teams in the office. So that's gonna be your product team, sales, implementation for us, uh, and they gather about two weeks before our new cycle starts. So everyone has had the chance to review the current pitches, so we're all on the same page, and we will talk through how to prioritize the work and which pitches we want to set aside. So um, it's kind of in the name of the talk, but when we set aside those pitches, they don't go into a backlog, um, and we're gonna talk more about why that is in a bit. So, from here, the selected pitches go through a process called handoff. This is usually like a one day or a half day activity uh, when the dev team members who will actually be working on the pitch get the chance to read through it, start exploring the related code, um, outlining steps that they know they're gonna need to take to actually build it, and then uh, have a chance to chat with the product manager or whoever was working on the pitch to answer any um, any questions that might have come up for them. So uh, then the building starts and will continue for the next six weeks. We do not wait for a release date at the end of the cycle. We are shipping continuously during the six week period. And after the six weeks, we move into that cool down period, which is mostly a self-directed time for developers. And um, we're gonna talk more about that as well. So now that we've run through the core elements of the shape up process, we're gonna go back to those three questions that we started with, um, beginning with how can our processes help us move more quickly? So to be successful in the market, we have to move at a pretty steady pace. And this can be challenging for smaller teams that are competing against much larger teams um, and for larger teams that are trying to coordinate maybe across different time zones or different ways of working. So, 
we encounter both of those challenges at workforce.com. So we need a way of working that's going to let us amplify our work both as a smaller team and as a larger team working across um, in different countries. So for context, we have seven developers in our US team. Um, one is a hybrid designer developer, and then we also have a US product manager. So I say we're a smaller team, but size is relative. You um, might be a smaller team with 30 people if you are competing against other players in the industry who have maybe two or three times that many staff. Um, but regardless of the size of our team, we all want to make the most of our resources and the time that we have. So one way that we have found um, to make the most of that time is by carving out these larger chunks of undistracted, really focused time for developers. So one of my favorite books that I've read recently is called Deep Work. It is by Cal Newport. He's a Georgetown uh, computer science professor. And in the book, he describes the value of being able to focus on a cognitively demanding task um, for a longer period of time without distractions. So he argues that this type of deep work is not only going to boost your productivity, but it's actually going to energize you, which can make the work experience a lot more meaningful and fulfilling. So there are three things that we've found provide more space for deep work. One is that we've established the understanding with other teams in the office that once a cycle's work is selected, that's what the dev team is going to be working on. So together, we have agreed that this is mo the most important work the team can be doing, and we don't want to distract them from it. Uh, we can always change course again in six weeks. And this cross-team agreement uh, is a benefit that comes out of the betting table. So being able to focus exclusively on a specific project sounds great. Um, but in reality, there's going to be unexpected things that come up during that time. So we need a way to handle those. A lot of uh, teams that use ShapeUp uh, also use, implement something called a reactive team. And this team is responding to those unexpected opportunities and needs. Uh, so at Workforce.com, we have one to two team members rotate through this reactive team uh, so that the rest of the team can have that really focused time on the planned work. And we found this to work really well. So uh, third way, we look for ways to reduce standing meetings. So this is the calendar of one of my coworkers. It is pretty typical for our individual contributors. Um, the team is mostly self-directed in setting their own meetings. And for some projects, it is more useful to have those regular meetings with your stakeholders. But oftentimes, meetings can be asynchronous communications. Um, but then when you introduce async communications, there are a lot of different platforms that you can do that on. So you might have email, you might have uh, Jira tickets, you might have like direct messaging, uh, and it can require frequent context switching to move between those platforms. So to try and limit the context switching that our team, and especially our dev team members, have to do, um, members of other teams at our company, so product management, implementation, have learned to use GitHub uh, so that they can comment directly on the relevant PRs. Uh, and so that has the added benefit of we have most of the information around a particular feature in one spot for future reference. So um, that is kind of like how a small, smaller team operates. Um, but what do you do when you're a larger distributed team? Uh, because you, when you're Working um, with a larger distributed team, like you might run into merge conflicts, and people have different ways of operating. So how can you find alignment with that? So there are two things that we have found helpful. Uh, one is having that uh, predictable start and end dates to the shape cycles allows us to align our schedules across our offices. And this is especially valuable as we are choosing what we want to work on. Uh, so that we don't end up making significant changes to the same area of the code base. 
And then two, we have that shared rhythm of six weeks of shaped work, two weeks of cool down. Uh, but the way that the individual teams use that time is left up to the individual offices and then project teams within those offices so that people have flexibility in choosing um, a way of working that really suits them. So if you're starting from a point where team members have these larger chunks of undistracted time, how do you make that time really engaging and productive? You've probably heard of the term flow state. It refers to times when you're, really, when you're fully immersed in a task. You're not struggling um, to focus on the task at hand. You're not struggling against self-referential thoughts. Um, you're just really focused. And if you've experienced this uh, type of flow state, you know that it's a really productive, sometimes even fun place to be in. And it ties back to that idea of deep work that we are talking about, um, where your work is really engaging. So for me, achieving a flow state can be difficult. So I want to set myself up to focus as best I can. Uh, in learning about flow state, I came across the author Stephen Kotler, uh, who is known for his research into human performance and the factors involved in achieving this flow state. So he says that we are more likely to experience a high level of focus and engagement when the task that we are working on is just a touch harder um, and more challenging than our current skill level. So that's our ideal state. But in reality, we're often tackling work that we've never done before, that stretches us a lot further than our current skill level. So this can be particularly true for people who are just starting out in their software uh, development career or just joining a new team. Um, and at workforce.com, we have hired people who are fresh out of boot camp and fresh out of computer science programs. We are also a growing team, which means we've onboarded a number of new people in the past year. So we are often working on projects that stretch us. And we need a way to try and close this skill to challenge ratio so that the team is going to feel engaged and is making progress and they're not feeling stuck and like they're just spinning their wheels. So we can't typically make a task any easier, but we can help the team uh, level up their skills. So one way that we've done this at Workforce.com is to build in opportunities to work in pairs in small groups. Um, this is going to provide you with that context uh, or provide you with someone else who has the same context as you, which is going to be really valuable when you need to bounce ideas off someone. And as you're working closely with other people, you are learning other ways of solving problems. You are learning how to communicate more challenging technical concepts and ask really precise questions, which is going to be a skill that benefits you at any level. Um, and this type of paired working has been especially helpful as we've onboarded new team members. Every member of your team, regardless of their skill level, is going to have more experience with your processes and your code base than someone who's coming in fresh. Um, so they can really help newcomers ramp up. We've um, found that working in at least pairs on our shaped work has the added benefit of making it easier to get timely code review because you have someone else who has the same context so they can offer that relevant feedback more easily and they have an equal investment in moving the work forward. So along with hands-on learning, we've found it valuable to set up um, a set aside specific times for skill building. As I mentioned earlier, the last few weeks of every cycle uh, are our cool down period. Uh, and the cool down period, as I mentioned, is um, more developer driven, meaning that team members can choose how they spend that time. And for newer devs, it can be an opportunity to build skills and knowledge that, are, that they know they will need for the next cycle, maybe take a course, pick up a bug fix that's going to expose them to a new area of the code base. And then for the more experienced members of the team, it offers a chance to work on projects that they find personally interesting and exciting. Um, and I really enjoy seeing what people take on during cool down. Uh, a lot of team members will experiment with like proofs of concept for like new ways of doing things. 
Someone built a QA tool recently that is benefiting both our product and our implementation team. Um, and the results of this self-German learning can then be amplified when we share what we learn with the team. And there are a couple ways that we do that. One is that the US product team will take two retreats every year. We treat these kind of as mini conferences. So everyone on the team will prepare a lightning talk of around like 10 minutes on a topic related to our tech stack. So they're getting the chance to kind of dive in deep and then they're sharing that with uh, their coworkers. And it's a really great way to highlight the value that everyone brings to the team because we all have our different interests and our uh, different areas of expertise. Along with the retreats, uh, every two weeks, we will have a, an organization-wide engineering talk. These are video chats that are more specifically focused on our code base, and uh, it might be one to two people presenting on a technical challenge that they've solved, how they have approached it. Um, it might be best practices for using a new tool that we've added. And we found this especially useful as uh, the offices have grown because it's a way of sharing that institutional knowledge that you can't really get anywhere else. So um, we've explored some of the practices around engagement and upskilling. Um, we're gonna move on to talking about how, those process, how our processes can help us uh, deliver the most value that we can for our users. So, there are always gonna be more opportunities to add value than we have time for. So we need a way to kind of compare and prioritize them. So when we consider adding value, uh, you can think about it in terms of effort and impact. When we are at the betting table, we focus on taking big bets and knocking out those easy wins. And then we're also looking for ways that we can get customer feedback early so we're making sure we're staying on the right course. So one example of a big bet that we took recently um, was earlier this year we decided to entirely rebuild our mobile app. Um, our app was originally built using React Native, but the US team spent a couple cycles recreating the app in Rails and then we added Hotwire for that layer of interactivity. So it's an interesting case study because we could have spent that time adding new features instead of changing up our tech stack. Um, but we took the bet that adding Hotwire would make, it, would make us more competitive in the long run uh, because we'd be able to ship more quickly as a team and then get the updates in the hands of our users faster. So the mobile app rebuild highlighted for me the ways the shape up methodology makes it easier to identify the most important work to be done and then actually ship that work. So to begin, we knew this, we didn't want the mobile app rebuild to be an extended uh, project and the appetites for the various features in the mobile app reflected that. To limit time investment, we initially focused on achieving parity. So we weren't adding like new bells and whistles um, and Setting an appetite really uh, helps us focus on, you know, helped us focus on delivering value because uh, it builds in checkpoints for making sure that what you are working on is still gonna be useful for your users. If something doesn't get done within the given appetite, we don't work on it by default in the next cycle. It has to go through that pitching and betting process again, where it's gonna get compared against other opportunities that have come up. Um, and that means that we do not maintain a backlog. Uh, each cycle is gonna start with a clean slate. So for devs, that means there's not a long list of unrelated tasks um, at the back of your mind that are competing for your attention um, compared to what you're currently working on. And there's a really clear goal line at the end of each cycle that makes it easier to track your progress. The mobile app also reflected the importance of iteration in delivering value. So iteration is not unique to the ShapeUp process, but it is really baked in. Uh, ShapeUp encourages focusing on vertical slices of work so that you, your users can get the basic job done uh, the common example is if your user is trying to get from point A to point B, 
Um, you might ultimately want to build them a car, but you start by building them a skateboard so that while you're building them the car, they can still get that basic job done. So for the mobile app work, iteration meant focusing on parity so that our users could at least accomplish the same tasks as they could with the old app. Um, we tried to strip in vertical slices uh, because of the benefits it provides. So one, it uh, allows you to get feedback from your actual users on the first iteration before you move on to the second one. And then two, since you've built something that is a complete unit of work, you have the freedom to move on to something else should another opportunity come up that's gonna be more valuable for you. So for our team, we chose to iterate a second cycle and we were able to inform our decisions in that cycle based on feedback that we collected from the actual product. So you now know the basics of the shape up process. You identify problems, you pitch solutions, and then you bet on the most valuable problems to solve. And you've also heard about what's worked well for us at workforce.com, particularly ways that we are trying to shape our processes around moving quickly, um, building an engaging work environment, and then prioritizing the most important work. So I am hoping that this has maybe sparked some thoughts for you about your own work experience and um, maybe highlighted some opportunities to try something new or maybe rethink something that isn't working as well. And going back to that idea that we started with, um, the processes are meant to be the background. They're not our focus. Um, when you boil down what our work is, our work isn't about following a particular methodology. Um, it is about the people that we are working with, the people that we are building our products for, and that shared big picture goal of delivering value while having a pretty, pretty enjoyable time doing it. Thank you. And we do have a table in the food room. I'm not sure what it's called. Um, so if you wanna come by and talk more, I'd love to chat with you. Um, and we have quite a few members of our team here, so if you want another perspective <laughs> on what the shape up process is like, you could chat with one of them. So. Um, we have a couple minutes, so does anyone have any questions? That's a great question. So um, he asked, like with our reactive team, how do we define what the reactive team works on versus what is going through the pitch process? So. We have actually been having an internal discussion about this recently. Um, we are trying to uh, make the reactive team kind of exclusive to work that we don't anticipate. So it might be an opportunity that we didn't know about at the beginning of the cycle, um, or maybe there is a way that we can improve a feature that a customer like, told us about um, and kind of saving it for that type of work. Uh, so the question is, uh, what if you're working on something that is going to be longer, take more time than a six-week cycle? Uh, do we always stick to that six weeks? So the way we approach larger pieces of work, um, the mobile app is kind of an example for that. We look for ways that we can take something big and break it down into smaller vertical slices so, and ship things kind of incrementally um, so that... Uh, we can still accomplish those, those big bets, uh, but not necessarily be tied up in it um, and overly committed to something. Because there's always the possibility that we're going in a direction um, and something could change the value of that direction. So we want to be able to remain flexible. All right, um, any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it.